put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. My friend Francois Duplessis here and I have been to some very, very interesting and very strange places using some of the weirdest transport that you can imagine. Well, one of the places that we visited was the place where the events of Jonah apparently took place. Now the story of Jonah is always a story that is ridiculed by those who are critical of the Bible, saying that this is an impossibility, it's just a myth. But Francois Duplessis, he's an expert in typology and he's also an expert on biblical stories and biblical truths and how the Bible is proved true by the sands of the archaeological digs that we have in the world. Francois, tell us about the story of John, Jonah. Thank you. Are you prepared to get into this bus? Absolutely. You've, you've Why not? Have been in this bus? <laughs> I've been in worse buses than that. Right? So let's travel from Baghdad to Nineveh. I was so excited when I saw the city for the first time. First impressions are lasting. I've been there quite a few times. To think that I'm walking on the very soil that Jonah walked. He had a fantastic evangelistic campaign there, Walter. I took my daughter there. There you see her. This is Esarhaddon's palace. It says in Matthew 12, verse 39, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in a whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And, now here's the typology, behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Jo uh, Walter was greater than all the prophets, all the priests, and all the kings. So all the kings and all the prophets and all the priests are types of the great antitypical Christ. Now, critics have questioned the authenticity of the Bible as far as Nineveh was concerned. And the locals living there don't read the Bible. So Americans and French and English people discovered the place. There's no time to tell you about the excavations, but it's exciting. There was such a place as Nineveh, and here I'm walking on the soil. Tell Kuyen Yuk, that's the mount they've excavated, this is where Esarhaddon had his palace, and it has been excavated. I was there just after the excavation. Just look at this tremendous bull with a few people sitting on it. They are so stupid, they're not intellectual. Look how they disgrace this bull. You know, the Bible is the only safe source and the only book we can trust. It's got all the truth, and archaeology confirms the authenticity of the Bible. Many of the names in Assyrian annals mention kings that the Bible also mentions, like uh, Shalmaneser, Sargon, and many others. Now, I'm going to read you an inscription from Korsapat, from Nimrud, and from Ash Ashur. Now, why did Jonah flee? God said, go and preach to the Assyrians. Why did he flee? Well, this picture tells you why. Look at how cruel they are. They're flaying people. They hang them on poles. It was a, a regime of terror. He didn't want to go there. Why preach for, to cruel people? He hated them, Walter, by the way. He rather would like to see them killed than saved. But God is so different. He cares about the most cruel person. And ladies, if you have a cruel husband, God loves him like he loved the Assyrians. He cares about cruel people and he sent a marvelous prophet to preach to them. Uh, 2 Kings 14.25, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet from gath Hefer. I looked for that place for many years, Walter. Eventually, I found it. The name changed in Israel. It's called Meshet. It's not far from, from Nazareth. So Jesus lived in the area where Jonah grew up. They both grew up at the same spot. Now this is the, uh, uh, the mosque, and Jonah, according to tradition, is buried here. You're looking at a marvelous gate 
in Nineveh. I'm reading from Jonah 3, 8 and 9. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. This is the king speaking. Let everyone call urgently on God. This is interesting to Yahweh, not on their gods. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Jonah was a straightforward hellfire preacher like you, Walter. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. This king had an idea of the kind God the Hebrews worshipped. Well, as I walked there, the story of Jonah, Jonah just flashed through my mind. Because Jonah is a type of Christ and worthy of our study. I haven't got time to discuss it here, but study it for yourself. May God bless you as you look at the life of this prophet and the life of Christ. By the way, the king was converted, Adatnirari III. He stopped all his wars. There was a moratorium and they became monotheists. That's a great story. May God bless you as you study the life of Christ in the light of archaeology. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. God has, in His wisdom, given us a road map to put the pieces of the puzzle together and to establish the whole truth in His Word. And prophecy is one of the keys to understanding the events on this planet. Now, I've titled this lecture, In the Mists of Time, and we're going to look at an amazing prophecy in the Bible, which has bearing on our time. Now the Bible is an amazing book. It's not just any book. It is the only book in the world that makes such tremendous claims. Here in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, the Lord says, I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. In other words, God is saying, I challenge you. Here, I'm telling you the future, not in some airy-fairy way, directly. Telling you the future ahead of time. So that when these things happen, you will know that I am God. Now, I was an atheist, and prophecy convinced me that there must be a God. You could not argue against it. It was perfect. It was not a Nostradamus or a fairy tale story here and there that was received under some drug-induced trauma. It was direct, to the point, understandable, unravelable. In order to understand prophecy, we need to understand the symbols that God uses. And I cannot just take the symbols from present day life. I have to use what the Word of God tells me to use. In other words, the tools for the unraveling of the Bible are in the Bible itself. So we can look at a little dictionary of prophetic terms, which is provided by the Bible itself. So when we read of the symbols of white linen, we know that we're dealing with the righteousness which comes from Christ. We read that in Revelation 19.8. When the Bible talks about trumpet and winds and all of these issues, then we use the symbol of trumpet and wind as a symbol of war, Jeremiah 49.36. Prostitution in the Bible can be literal, but in a prophetic sense it's idolatry. Leviticus 17.7, there's a whole host of texts in James and Isaiah and Isaiah 51, etc., which tell us that this is what it means. When we talk about waters and seas and bodies of water, then the Bible tells us that this means nations. So when you read about the great winds churning up the sea, then what does it mean? It means wars amongst the nations. That's exactly what it means. And there's no conjecture, there's no guessing. A woman in the Bible, unless it's a literal woman, is a church in a prophetic sense. Ephesians 5, to 24, Christ is the bridegroom, he's coming to fetch his bride, the church. Zion, God's people, Isaiah 51, 16, 
A beast, and this is an important one. A beast in the Bible is a kingdom or the king standing for that kingdom. We read it in Daniel 7.18. A horn is also a kingdom or a king. A horn is normally used as a subdivision of that kingdom. Daniel 8.21 tells us it's a kingdom or a king. So I cannot make it something else. I cannot make it a computer in Brussels when the Bible says it's a kingdom. The rock is Jesus Christ throughout the Bible. That is the rock of my salvation, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 4, and in Genesis and Deuteronomy, Old, New Testament, it makes no difference. Now today, we want to look at an ancient king's dream and see what bearing it has on the times we live in. And this king was the king of Babylon, Nabukuduri Usur, or Nebuchadnezzar, as he is known uh, to us in the Bible. Now, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem in the year 586 BC, and he took many of the Israelites captive, amongst them Daniel and his three friends. And there are many reliefs showing how these captives were taken to Jerusalem. It's a sad story. Many of them had to serve in the king's palace, and uh, they were made eunuchs in order to serve there. And it is a story of what happened when Israel turned against God and decided to be disobedient to his precepts. God allowed circumstances to develop where they were taught eternal lessons. But some of them were faithful, Daniel and his friends. Here they are in the king's palace, presented as wise men because they received all the training that they needed at the hands of the king. So he put them through the Babylonian training system. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel tells us in chapter 2, he had a dream, and this dream troubled him. And his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him, so the king summoned the magicians and the enchanters and the sorcerers and the astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. And when they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Daniel 2, 1 to 3. Now, no king had ever done this before. He had this dream, but it, the, the Bible says, the thing has gone from me. He forgot what it was about, the details. But he knew it was important, so he consulted all these wise men to tell him not only the dream, but to interpret it as well. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, now the Chaldeans are the educated religious people, the thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Now that was a system of justice in those days. They used to cut people up, sometimes send portions to various parts of the realm to show that this is what would happen if you disobeyed the command of the king. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon earth that can show the king the matter. Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such a thing of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. It is a rare thing that the king requireth. And there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon, which would include, of course, Daniel and his three friends. So these people were supposed to be representatives of the magical world and of knowledge, and yet they were unable to interpret this dream. Now Daniel went to make intercession, so he went to Ariel, the king's god, and he said, Give us time. We want to consult with our God. Daniel turned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Ananiah, Michael, and Azariah. And uh, he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Daniel 2, 17 and 18. So here we can see that the revealer of mysteries is God, and they pray. And they ask God to tell them what this means. And then God intervenes and tells Daniel in a vision 
not only what the dream was, but also the interpretation. Now he runs back to Ariel, Daniel 2.24, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. And the king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in the dream and interpret it? Daniel says, Sure thing, I can do it. No, he doesn't. He does something very humble. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Daniel 2, 27 to 28. It always surprises me when people remove the Old Testament and say we no longer need it. Yeah, this prophecy is for the latter days. It's for our time. We need to study this basic prophecy in the book of Daniel in order to understand the prophecies in the book of Revelation. It is the key to those prophecies. The stories in the book of Daniel are typological of the events at the end of time. So we might read them as little stories, but they're not just stories. They are an enactment, an embodiment of the events that will take place on this planet before the coming of the Lord. They concern us and our time. So every single nuance is important. Now here we read that the magicians, the soothsayers, cannot show unto the king, and the astrologers and all of these cannot show unto the king what needs to be done. There is a God in heaven that reveals secret. Is it possible that at the end of time the mindset of the people will it begin again be of such a nature that they will rely on the magicians and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers and the astrologers to receive the answers to their questionings? Whereas Daniel says there is a God in heaven who reveals such things. I believe that in type we are in a time when exactly the same circumstances that prevailed then prevail today. Here's an interesting news clip from the BBC. And this was when Reagan and Gorbachev decided to convene a summit in order to determine how they were going to deal with the new situation that had arisen in the former East Bloc. Let's have a look at this. And then in September, Gorbachev proposed a pre-summit meeting in Reykjavik, Iceland. Washington agreed. The astrologer fixed the time and the date of departure, and at 9.45 on October the 9th, Reagan flew to Reykjavik. For instance, if you have very bad Saturn, you should cultivate Jupiter so that... Uh... Isn't that rather sad? Just as the king had summoned the astrologers and the wise men and all of these, so the presidents of the world today consult the Sangomas and the astrologers that determine how event, events should be interpreted. Daniel 2 verse 29, As you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to things to come. So it's a future projection. And the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. History in advance. Only the Bible can make this claim. Daniel 2, 32 to 33, He was shown a statue. And this statue had a head of gold and it had arms of silver and hips of bronze and legs of iron and feet of iron and clay and ten toes also with iron and clay. And he was looking at the statue and he explained to Nebuchadnezzar what it all meant. Well, as you were lying there, God gave you a vision of what was going to happen on this planet and he showed him a statue. In Daniel 2, verse 32, 33, it tells us that the head of the statue was made of pure gold. Its chest and its arms were made of silver. Its belly and thighs of bronze. Its legs of iron and its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. In this statue, we see a sweep through time into the future. So the prophet takes the king into the very time in which we live. And that's why it's important that we understand these prophecies. 
While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Daniel 2 verse 34. Now we've already seen what the symbolism of the rock stands for. It stands for Jesus Christ. So this statue, the kingdoms of the world, will be brought to an end by this rock, the return of Christ, striking the political systems of this planet on the feet. Please note, the stone doesn't strike the hips, it strikes the feet. In other words, the culmination of history takes place in the time period of the feet. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. So the whole system is eradicated when this great event takes place. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, nothing left of these systems. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth, Daniel 2, 35. So the kingdom of God will replace all earthly kingdoms when this great event takes place. For behold, says Isaiah in chapter 65, verse 17, I create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. That whole system will be removed from the minds of men. Now what's the interpretation of this dream? Daniel not only shows the king what he dreamed, what he dreamt, but he also gives him the interpretation. Thou, O king, are king of kings. Please note that we are dealing with a lowercase k in king of kings. There's another king who is uppercase, king of kings, Jesus Christ. So we have an earthly one who is king of kings, and we'll have a heavenly one that's king of kings. For the God of heaven has given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. So even the earthly kings receive their commission from God. Whether for good or whether for evil, that is the choice each king can make. But Babylon, represented by the king of Babylon, was the head of gold. Now, gold is the most precious of the minerals mentioned here, but it's also the softest. Then we go to silver, which is harder, less valuable. Then we go to iron, which is still harder and still less valuable. So in other words, the kingdoms become harder, but their value actually declines. We're not as great as we think we are. We're actually going backwards. You, O king, are king of kings. You are this head of gold. So the first kingdom is Babylon. And after thee shall arise another kingdom, which shows us that we are dealing with kingdoms, inferior to thee. Can you see the decline? The silver is less valuable, but nevertheless it is harder. Daniel 2 verse 39. It's chest and arms of silver depicting the next kingdom to take over, the Medes and the Persians. But the king of Babylon was astounded because he just set up this magnificent kingdom and there was no way he was going to believe that his kingdom would come to an end. If we look at the archaeological finds regarding this king, there are some fascinating statements. May it last forever. And here a prophet says, it's not going to last forever. And the king was highly upset. The statue said, your kingdom will be replaced. Another one inferior to yours will take over, and then another, and then another. And so the king said, after a while, after contemplating these things for who knows for how long, came to the conclusion that he was going to defy the king of heaven. And he said, bring me the people. Make for me a statue, gold from top to bottom. I defy the God of heaven who says my kingdom will come to an end. My kingdom will not come to an end. My kingdom will last forever. Gold all the way down and bring the people. Let them bow down and acknowledge the superiority of this kingdom and of Babylon. In the same way, Satan wants to set up a kingdom on this earth. And he says, you will bow down to it, you will pay me homage, you will be obedient to me. And in the same way, the powers of earth will give their power unto this system and require that everyone bows down to them. We are heading for some interesting times. The same confrontation as we had in the time of Babylon will happen in anti-typical Babylon 
for when the time comes. Well, the three friends, what happened to them? The three friends refused to bow down. They were thrown into the fiery furnace. But one like the Son of God was with them. And the king was astounded. And the fetters burnt away. But there was not even a smell of smoke upon them. In other words, when we are thrown into the fiery furnace of affliction in this world, as long as the Son of God is with us, not one hair on our head will be singed. We need to have a relationship with the Son of God if we are to survive the times that are upon us. Well, the great Babylon that he had built was magnificent. There were the hanging gardens of Babylon, the most beautiful palaces. He had built these hanging of gardens for his wife, who was not used to living in an area without mountains, so he built one. And uh, the magnificence of his kingdom is indescribable. The lion, symbol of Babylon, was on the Ishtar Gate. Here we are at the Ishtar Gate in the Pergamum Museum, where the actual stones, the actual tiles, were dug up from the sands of time and placed here. Isn't it amazing that God used people who read the Bible to go and find all these places? There were all of these places to be found right there amidst the peoples that lived there. But it took people who read the Bible who actually went and found these places. We can trust the Bible. It's a trustworthy book. Because all of these stones tell us, Thy word is truth. These portals for the astonishment of multitudes of people with beauty I adorned. We can understand his mindset. We can understand his arrogance. For the astonishment of men, I have built this. All these Babylonian systems, all these statements by Nebuchadnezzar. But this kingdom was to come to an end. It would be destroyed. And the Bible tells us that a king ruled by the name of Belshazzar when this event took place. And another king who was named 150 years before his birth, Cyrus, would come and accomplish that which God had said he would do. Now, the famous Nabonidus cylinder was found, which actually confirms that Belshazzar was ruling at that time. You see, the higher critics always want to run down and ridicule the Bible. And they looked at the historic events and they said, there was no Belshazzar who ruled at this time. The king was Nabonidus. There was no Belshazzar. And then they found this famous cylinder and it read, And to Belshazzar, the exalted son, the offering of my body, do thou place the adoration of the great deity on his heart. May he not give way to sin, may he be satisfied with life's abundance, and may reverence for the great divinity dwell in the heart of Belshazzar, my firstborn favorite son. This is a quote from God Speaks to Modern Man, page 154. So here we have evidence that there was a king called Belshazzar. The only record before that was in the Bible. And here it is. Now this king, Nabonidus, he was the ruler, but he had chosen to serve in a monastic capacity. He had separated himself for the worship of his gods. And so he had given kingship to Belsasha. In 1882, they found an inscription which confirmed that Nabonidus had left kingship to his son. And in 1916, they found a joint oath. And in 1924, they found this inscription which read, I conferred kingship to my son Belshazzar. And the Bible, once again, is vindicated. And on this fateful day when Cyrus marched in and they were having a party using the very ornaments of the sanctuary, defying the God of heaven, here, writing appeared upon the wall. And this king looked on in astonishment. If we defy the God of heaven, sooner or later probation closes. We need to make our choices now. When I return, we shall be looking at what happened in the rest of the story. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. On that fateful day, when Babylon fell, the writing appeared upon the wall. 
God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Mene. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Tekel. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Peres. The time for Babylon to go had come. The Cyrus cylinder reveals how history confirms the accuracy of the Bible. It really is an amazing book. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. So God sets up the stage for the next kingdom. 539 BC to 331 BC, the Medes and the Persians ruled in that area. And verse 39 says, Then another third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. You know, there are critics that say, Ah, oh, but Greece never ruled over all the earth. Well, maybe not politically, but philosophically it did. The philosophy of Greece is a worldwide phenomenon. All the wisdom of the Chaldeans, all the wisdom of the Babylonian system is found in all the systems of the world today, religious and otherwise. So these pervasive uh, psychologies and theologies have pervaded the world systems and we find them in every aspect of society. So yes, philosophically it did rule through all the world. I'm persuaded that there was none nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding over both his birth and action. Historical Library, Book 16. The Bible had predicted it. The time had come. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom strong as iron. Now, history tells us that the Greeks were conquered by the Romans, Daniel's 2.40. It's also interesting that there are two legs. There was an Eastern and a Western Roman Empire. What's also fascinating is if we look at the, the armor that these people wore, the Greeks wore bronze, and they had uh, a fixed breastplate and heavy bronze armor. The Romans, on the other hand, as the arrow shows, they had iron. So we moved from bronze to iron, and it was loose plates. They were more movable. Their armor was far better designed, so they had the edge. So even in the metals, the Bible is absolutely accurate. Long before the time. You know, the critics say Daniel was written after the event. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls show that the dialect used there, the dialect of the Aramaic that was used in that portion of the Bible, tells us that it was of Persian time and not of modern times. So the Bible is right once again. And the Bible is vindicated. The book of Daniel is authentic, written hundreds of years before these events took place. Verse 40, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaketh all these things shall break in pieces and bruise. So this would be a cruel kingdom. Hard. Hard. But unfortunately of less value. The famous historian Edward Gibbon says, The images of gold, silver, brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome, history and decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The Bible can be trusted. So from 168 BC to 476 AD, we have the Roman Empire in its pagan Roman form. Just as you saw, the feet and the toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, says verse 41. So this will be a divided kingdom. So when Rome collapses, it will be divided. The remnants of Rome are still there. And we can find them even in the toes. The iron element, the Roman law, the Roman aspects, the Roman territory are still there, even in the kingdom of the toes. As the toes were partly iron and partly black, baked clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. They won't have equal strength. Now, when Rome was divided, it is fascinating that there were ten major divisions in that kingdom. Now, it's fascinating that when Rome finally fell, it was divided, the Western Roman Empire, into ten states. And here we have them. The Suevi, the Visigoths, the Franks, the Vandals, the Anglo-Saxons, and all of these which constituted 
the ten kingdoms of the demise and of the toes. Today, the remnants of these are the Alemanni, the Germans, the Burgundians, the Swiss, the Franks, the French, the Lombards, the Italians, the Saxons, the English, the Suevi, the Portuguese, and the Visigoths the Spanish, and three of them have become extinct. The Aruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. And we will be dealing with that in another lecture as to why they became extinct. And whereas thou sawed iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Daniel 2, verse 43. So these kingdoms will try to reunite by mingling with the seed. Now, did Europe do that? Did they try to reestablish the Holy Roman Empire by intermingling at the political level? Yes, they certainly did. And so the kings of Europe tried everything to reunite by intermarrying and placing different kings from different nations on different thrones. But Daniel chapter 2, verse 43 says, But they shall not cleave one to another even as iron is not mixed with clay. So it will not happen. When the Bible says so, it is so. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Here we have a picture of Queen Victoria and the rulers and the monarchs of Europe. And we can see that they were all related at some stage. In fact, on her deathbed, Queen Victoria, this great queen of the British Empire, could speak only German. Her mother tongue came back to her. But it didn't work. The kingdoms still remained separate. Some strong, some weak, some changing from weak to strong and back from strong to weak over time. But they would always strive to reunite. Here we have the Pope croning, crowning Charles the Great as emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And while he was kneeling there, they thought that he had reunited this great power. There his kingdom fell apart. So the Bible says they will try. They will strive, but they will not succeed. In the end, they will also strive, and maybe there'll come a point when they will crown and say, we've done it, and then it will fall apart again. And the Charleses and the Louis and all of these people that strove to reunite and to counter the word of God, all their efforts came to naught. Louis XIV persecuted people for their religious beliefs and he tried as much as he could to reunite Europe, but he failed. There was a prophecy against him. And so one after the other, they came and they tried, the Charleses and the Louis, and who they all were, they tried. Napoleon came and he said, I'll do it, I can do it. But eventually he met his Waterloo and all failed. Napoleon said, I wanted to found a European system, a European code of laws, a European court of appeals. There would have been but one people throughout Europe. Europe would soon have become one nation. But the effort failed. There was a prophecy against him. Thirty years after Waterloo, Dr. Thomas Arnold said, the deliverance of Europe from the dominion of Napoleon was affected neither by Russia, nor by Germany, nor by England, but by the hand of God. People are in rebellion against God. They wanted their way. They side with the other party. They tried to prove the word of God untrue. There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Daniel 2.28. We need to study this. How does it affect us? What's going to happen to us? Well, the next one who came along and said, I'll do it, was Kaiser Wilhelm. Kaiser Wilhelm was a very interesting Kaiser. He was very bombastic. He was a short man. But his army consisted of tall men. And he used to make sure that only the tallest and the greatest would serve him. And he was going to do the very thing that nobody could do before him. Here he is with his various crosses, his Maltese cross, and all of these emblems 
of his political and religious ideologies. Now there's an interesting story which goes like this. At the Cathedral of Metz, outside this cathedral in France, there is a statue of Daniel pointing to the scroll. And this cathedral was in dire straits. It was in disrepair. The roof was leaking. So they appealed to Kaiser Wilhelm for funds to repair it. And he said, if you remove the head of the statue of Daniel outside and replace it with mine, I'll do it. So they duly took it off, put it in the archive, put Kaiser Wilhelm's head there. He repaired the, pl repaired the place for him. What was he doing? What was he saying? He was saying just like Nebuchadnezzar was saying, I want a statue, gold from top to bottom. I defy the God of heaven. I defy Daniel the prophet who said, they shall not cleave one to another. Remove his head, put mine there, and I will show you I will do it. Isn't that amazing? And there the head remained. And the kingdom that he was striving for fell apart. And another came... And he also failed. They wanted to defy the prophet Daniel. In other words, defy the word of God. Well, they did not succeed. Fascinating story. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and set us up kings. Daniel 2, 21. Adolf Hitler, he knew about the statue. And it is Adolf Hitler who gave the command that the statue should be Changed again. Take away the head of Kaiser Wilhelm, put back the statue of Daniel. What's he saying? He's saying the exact same thing, just the reverse of the coin. He's saying, with or without the head of Daniel, I'll do it. I don't care. I want a statue, gold, from top to toe. We will do it. And eventually his dream was shattered. And the Berlin Wall was erected in Germany. And Europe was more divided than ever before. But the time came when the wall should fall. You see, we are moving towards a time when the final clash between the statue of gold and the ideology as depicted in the Bible, allegiance to the God of heaven, will again come to a fiery furnace clash. And we need to be with the Son of God when that happens. By the way, when that statue is struck... It is the whole statue that disappears, every remnant of it. But I thought the head of gold disappeared when the Medo-Persians took over. And I thought the Medo-Persians disappeared when the Greeks took over, and they disappeared when Rome took over. No. The political system might have disappeared, but the ideology remained. So the system of Babylon, the religion of Babylon, is alive and well and living in the world today. The same defiance that took place then takes place now. The same consultation with those that do not rely on the word of God for their depictions of the future takes place today. The kings of the world as verily act as Babylon as they did then. The Medo-Persians refined and retained many of the components of the philosophy that prevailed in Babylonian times. So that philosophy was added and certain rules were added to make government stronger and to enforce the will more on the people than they did before. And then the Greeks took over. Greek philosophy rules the world to this very day. Aristotle is the one that gave rise to the theory of evolution, not Darwin. He just perpetuated an ancient Greek philosophy, a defiance of God and the word of God. And in the same way, we have the Roman system of government in the world today as verily as if Rome still existed in its pagan form. The Mao must fallen, the wall must fall, the Soviet Union no longer exists. A new dispensation. Are we going to clear away the prophecy of Daniel? Reading Europe's future, is it going to become one? Does Maastricht solve the problem? The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. There is the promise. Now, when God says he's going to bring an end to the kingdoms of this planet, that's exactly what he means. And how much will be left of it? Nothing. It will be like chaff. It will disappear. 
and the kingdom of God will be set up, leaving not a trace of all of those kingdoms. These kingdoms serve their purpose in the hands of God. God permits them for a time until their defiance of God becomes so great that he has to remove them. We are living in the toes of the statue, and sooner or later God will intervene. And when they eradicate his principles, make void his law, it will be time for him to act. And the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Daniel 2 verse 44. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. What a promise. The rock cut out without human hands, what does that mean? It means there will be no human factor in this crushing of the statue. It will be something that God does without any human intervention. Jesus Christ, the rock, will come and he will put an end to these kingdoms. The Bible says, Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. We have a choice to make here. Either the stone crushes us, or we fall upon the stone and we are changed. And we allow God to work in our hearts. There are people that claim that the statue is not struck at the feet. They would have us believe that the anti-Christian system, the anti-Christ system, reigning at the time when Christ returns was of Greek origin and he's a Greek king. The Bible says no. It happens in the toes. It happens in our time. It happens in the period when the European powers are ruling. Everyone who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, remember. But he on whom it falls will be crushed. Now we have to look in future as to how these things fit together. Why will God intervene at this stage? What is it that the European powers and the powers in the world will be doing to cause God to give the final solution to the problem and say, so far and no, no further. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. God is going to rule on this planet. And all these earthly kingdoms, they all had their opportunity with all their philosophies. Every single one of them at one stage or another being Nebuchadnezzar's and saying, I don't care what you and your prophets have to say. Make that statue head to gold. The book of Revelation says they will make an image to the beast and everybody will be compelled to bow down to the image of the beast. A reference to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel chapter 2 is the key which unlocks and unravels the prophecies of the book of Revelation. And here is the crux of the matter. Daniel 2 verse 45. The dream is certain and the interpretation thereof is sure. You can go through the sands of time and you can see whether God's word is trustworthy or not. Check out the history. Look at the prophecy in the book of Daniel 600 years before Christ. Years before a media Persian or a Greek or a Roman Empire, let alone the division of the Roman Empire into ten states and the submission of three. See whether God's word is not being fulfilled word by word, letter by letter. We can trust the word of God. We can trust what the Lord Jesus tells us will happen. And we need to know what will happen. Not that prophecy will save us. Prophecy will never save us. But prophecy can tell us where we stand in the stream of time and can give an earnestness to our religion and compel us to make right. Because God is truth and he means what he says. A God of love, but a God of justice as well. The time will come when he says, so far and no further. And we need to make a choice right now. My prayer is that we will all choose the God of heaven who so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. <music>